Hi, welcome. I'm Scott Succo, the Executive Director of the Liver Coalition of San Diego, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Q&A, sponsored by the Liver Coalition of San Diego. Before we get started, I wanted to go through a couple housekeeping items for you. Um, this is a webinar, but we do have the chat feature enabled with the Q&A. So as the webinar goes, we've got a moderator that will be monitoring uh, the chat box and fielding your questions and then presenting them to our presenter tonight. So please use the question and chat box to put your questions forward so that they all get answered. Also, I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsors. Tonight would not be possible without the support of our sponsors from industry uh, who allow this webinar to take place. And I would take a moment and have each of them kind of come on and uh, thank them personally. So to start with, I'd like to welcome Carl with Dynavax. Hey, Carl. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for your welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. It really is a pleasure for us here at Dynavax to support the community and support Dr. Hasnian and Scott with the Liver Coalition. Uh, at Dynavax, we are fairly new into uh, this arena of having a vaccine. We are actually uh, makers of a brand new two-dose, one-month adult hepatitis B vaccine. As many of you probably know, the way to get vaccinated for hepatitis B has always been to wait six months and go through three different injections. And we are changing the marketplace with our vaccine. Um, so to be able to really support the community and support um, healthcare, providers within uh, the liver and hepatology and GI community uh, is something that we really appreciate the opportunity to do. So Scott, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I know we have a few introductions to go through, so I'll keep it uh, just at that. And I just want to thank you again. And Dr. Hasnain, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I can't wait to hear you talk. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Thanks for being here. Uh, next, I'd like to show a video from Esai. And although um, the sound on our end, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, uh, the vid video is so dynamic and it's got some great inspirational wording. So if you've got a minute, pay attention to the screen and read along with me. And we just want to thank our partners from Esai. Thank you again, our partners from ESI. And next, I'd like to introduce Greg from Gilead. Uh, Gilead and Greg, nice to have you in the house. Thank you, Scott. And thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, Gilead's been in hepatology for about 20 years, and we have medicines for hep B and hep C cure medicines as well. And I'm looking forward to another great talk by Dr. Hassanin. He always does an amazing job. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, and then also, I want to acknowledge Abvi for supporting tonight's webinar as well. So thank you very much, Abvi, for support, supporting tonight and making it happen. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce the president of our board of directors, Terry Cunningham, who will provide an official agency welcome. <laughs> Terry? Okay. Yep, I think your camera. If you turn your camera on, then we'll be able to see you. Okay. There you go. There. <laughs> Hello, and uh, thank you so much for being here for another in our series of webinars on liver diseases. 
uh, the Liver Coalition of San Diego was formed after the uh, American Liver uh, Association, uh, Liver Foundation, sorry, uh, decided to close its uh, local offices. And we, we wanted to form in order to have a 501c3 that addressed liver disease so that when we're fundraising, all of our funds that are raised stay here in San Diego and don't go to a national organization. So you can rest assured that any donations that you make to the Liver Coalition of San Diego will be used here in San Diego County. Um, again, we're very pleased to have experts providing these webinars and tonight should be very fascinating. I hope that uh, you enjoy it and please let us know if you have comments and questions, we would be more than happy to hear them and to answer any questions that you might have. Again, thank you so much for being here. And now I'll turn it over to Melissa Ferrari, who is going to do uh, the introductions. Thank you so much. Bye. Hello, welcome. My name is Melissa and I'm gonna be your moderator this evening. I'm a physician assistant working at Scripps and GI and liver disease. And I'm also the co-chair of the Liver Co Coalition's um, Ad Associate Advisory Committee. Tonight we have a great presentation. Um, it's going to be on autoimmune hepatitis. We'll learn a bit about how it presents and how it should be managed. Our presenter is Dr. Tarek Hassanin. He is the medical director of the Southern California Liver and GI Center and is also a professor of medicine at UCSD. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hassanin and throughout his presentation, if you have any questions, please share them on the side. You'll see a space where you can sign or where you can message me over those questions and I'll field them appropriately throughout the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hassanin. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Scott, thank you, Terry, and thanks for all the uh, supporters of these programs. Uh, without the support of our industry and the efforts that uh, Terry, Scott, and Melissa, and other members of the Liver Coalition, we cannot really help our patients. The whole idea of this coalition is to help the patients with liver disease and get them more aware of what's new in liver disease and what new therapies are becoming available. San Diego is very privileged to have a number of liver specialists in the field. We have programs like the UCSD program, the Scripps Green program, we have big institutions in research, and we are Southern California GI and liver centers. We, most of us were academicians who moved in the community to offer what we call a community tertiary care. Uh, the, the, the organizers asked me to touch base on what we call autoimmune liver disease. And autoimmune liver disease, although initially people think about it that it is one disease, you're gonna find out it is not only one disease, it's a family of diseases. And these diseases are characterized by one thing. That thing is that the body immune system, my personal immune system would attack my liver. And it depends where it attacks the liver. And we're gonna talk about this in the next few slides. But what I wanna make sure every individual understands about liver disease is that if you have a chronic liver condition, whatever the condition is, we call it in our term hepatitis. When I tell my patients you have hepatitis, they always say, no, I don't have hepatitis C, I don't have hepatitis B. We always think that in late term, when we say hepatitis, it means a virus. No, in, in medical terms, hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. Now that inflammation can be related to a virus, can be related to alcohol, can be related to too much fat, can be related to our immune system attacking the liver cells. 
causing the liver cells to die and have inflammation. Now, any liver disease, if it goes on for years and years, we call it chronic liver disease. And doctors define chronic liver disease if the liver injury, whatever the cause of the injury is, is beyond six months of continuous injury. That's what we call chronic liver disease. So you can imagine, I can live with chronic liver disease and never die from a liver problem. When do I die from my liver? If, if that chronic liver disease progresses to the degree of developing cirrhosis. And cirrhosis means significant scarring of the liver. Because what comes after cirrhosis? When the patient reaches the point of cirrhosis, over five to 10 years or less, they can get into losing the functionality of liver cells. And that's what we call decompensated liver cirrhosis that can lead to death. Of course, when I get my patient uh, or I get the patient in the stage of decompensated cirrhosis, my job is to return them back to compensated stage, or if I fail, I give them a liver transplant. So here, normal liver, and you can imagine chronic inflammation, if you go anticlockwise, chronic inflammation, the liver is inflamed, the liver enzymes are high, over 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, the patient would develop what we call cirrhosis, and patients with cirrhosis can develop liver failure or liver cancer. So that's when I do an autopsy or take a liver out from someone's body, a healthy liver is on the left side, a cirrhotic liver is on the right side. And you can see the difference between these two pictures, lots of scar tissue, all that white stuff in the right uh, picture is what we call fibrosis, then the liver gets nodular, and that's what we call cirrhosis. So what makes a liver develop cirrhosis? Alcohol, too much alcohol, viral hepatitis, B and C, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, the fatty liver, some of the autoimmune diseases, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, and there's a lot of other conditions. The job of the doctor, the liver specialist, is to manage these diseases that can lead to chronic liver injury so we can avoid reaching cirrhosis. If it happens that my patient shows up and they already have cirrhosis, the unique feature of a liver is regeneration and we can reverse cirrhosis. We can actually eliminate the alcohol, control the hepatitis B and C, get them to lose some weight, get the fat out of the liver, minimize the liver injury, and guess what? The liver can kick in and remodel, and even early stages of cirrhosis, we can return them back to less cirrhosis. Now, we don't want to wait on the patient to go to decompensation. What decompensation means? If my patients start bleeding from viruses, develop a lot of ascites, they start getting confusion, which we call encephalopathy of the turn yellow, that's when we call them decompensation. And these patients with decompensation, when they come to me, I try to return them back to the compensated stage. And if I am not successful, I put them on the liver transplant list. How patients suffer from cirrhosis? They develop what we call portal hypertension. If you think of the liver as a filter and you clog the filter, the blood will back behind it. And that's what we call portal hypertension. And that's how they develop the viruses, the fluid in the belly that we call ascites, or the liver cell stops working or gets weaker in cleaning the toxins from the blood, and the patient would manifest with what we call encephalopathy, or they start turning yellow. These are concepts, whether you have hepatitis B, C, you have NASH, you have uh, 
uh, too much alcohol, you drinking, if you have a combination of all this, or if you have autoimmune liver disease. So what's, what's autoimmune liver disease? That's our topic. But I always like to uh, present the natural history of liver disease in respect to the cause of the liver disease. So when you say, I have autoimmune liver disease, you can have what we call autoimmune hepatitis, where the immune system, the body immune system that protects you from infections, from, from cancer, from other things, is strong enough that it attacks the liver. And if it attacks the liver cells, then we call it autoimmune hepatitis. If it attacks the bile ducts, which is the plumbing of the liver, but it attacks only the very fine plumbing, we call it primary biliary cholangitis, and if it attacks the big plumbing tubes of the liver, which is the bile ducts, the big ones, we call it primary sclerosing cholangitis. The good news is we have new treatments for each of these entities. There's a very rare condition, which we call IG4 related cholangitis, which can easily be treated. But the problem is it is not very popular and a lot of times we miss it unless we are really working the patient for the category of autoimmune liver disease. And then we have what we call sarcoidosis, which is part of that syndrome or even celiac disease that affects the liver. So if we take the autoimmune hepatitis, because I get a lot of patients who say, I have autoimmune hepatitis. And actually it is, a sometimes a challenging uh, diagnosis to make because there's no one test that tells you you have autoimmune hepatitis. It's a constellation of things when you have it, plus a liver biopsy consistent with the autoimmune hepatitis, that's when we call it. Because once I call you that you have definitely autoimmune hepatitis, then we, it's uh, treatment for many years, including steroids and immune suppression. So it's a chronic condition. It's self-perpetuating. It tends to be more common in women than men. And we see it in younger age and older age. And you can imagine it's not very common. We talk about 10, 15, 20 cases every 100,000 uh, individuals. And, and we see it increasing lately. Anyway, when I think of it and when the blood tests are suggestive of it, then we take a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And the diagnosis once confirmed, we commit the patient to immune suppression. What is immune suppression? Their immune system is so strong, it's attacking their liver. It can be attacking the skin and giving them psoriasis, or it can be attacking the, the joints and give them rheumatoid arthritis. So autoimmune hepatitis is a robust immune system that attacks the liver cells. And now I need to slow it down. I need to take your immune system and calm it down. Calm it down means steroids and immune suppression. And this is a cartoon. I don't want you to get into the details, but you can see up there, we have what we call a liver cell. And autoimmune hepatitis is not only one mechanism that makes the immune system attack the liver cell, multiple mechanisms. And accordingly, to really control it, we give more than one medicine. We try nowadays new medication that affects or controls each of these pathways that injury the liver cell. So I can tell you this morning, we were on a national, uh, international conference call. There's a brand new medicine getting developed an infusion that we give every few weeks that controls that disease that is currently in clinical trial and everyone is excited about it. Okay, now, if someone misses that disease, 
we tend to see the patient already cirrhotics in one third of our patients. And the problem is the same problem in every liver disease. Patients don't have symptoms. When they have symptoms, it might be a little bit late. And accordingly, we like to screen anyone who has autoimmune anything. So if someone say, oh, I have rheumatoid arthritis, we look into their liver. If someone says, I have psoriasis, we look into their liver. If someone says, I have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we look into their liver to make sure we are not missing autoimmune hepatitis that we can control it. Because if we can control it, guess what? We can eliminate the inflammation from the liver, normalize the liver numbers, eliminate the scarring, and prevent the liver from developing into a chronic disease and cirrhosis. We classify our patients into two major types, autoimmune type one, autoimmune type two. Very specific blood tests makes us differentiate these patients. And each of these types have a little bit difference in the way how we manage them. And it's all based on the blood tests. We tend to see autoimmune type one in, at any age, but if a, a child or a young adolescent shows up with the picture of autoimmune hepatitis, they tend to have the type two autoimmune hepatitis. And we can relate it to some genetic susceptibility in, in, in these cases. This is what we see on biopsies and very complex liver tissue that, that our uh, uh, pathologist we like, when I do a biopsy, I call the pathologist and we discuss all what's on this list, if it is there or not. The more we see on the biopsy, the more we are confident of the diagnosis. And again, it's easy to manage. I can give patients within two weeks, I can really control that disease with steroids. And because we know prednisone and corticosteroids, it's tough on the body if we give it to them for years, then we introduce what we call another immune suppression medication as a cyoprim, and that allows me to decrease the amount of steroids, avoid the patient from getting into complications. In any case, future therapies in development really will replace these approaches because once I start my patient on this treatment, I need to normalize the liver enzymes for at least two to three years before I start changing my treatment. And what I'm trying to do is to put them into what we call remission. Remission means no symptoms. Maybe they never had symptoms, but the liver enzymes is perfectly normal. And if I do a biopsy, I find that that biopsy shows totally normal liver tissue. That's when I say the patient is in remission and I can change their medications. Now, sometimes we do this, and after we change the medicine, guess what? The patient comes back, and the liver enzymes are high, and we have to restart again the two, three years again by because they relapsed, and so the risk of relapse is there, so we keep a close eye on our patients to avoid that. Now, what about if someone comes and say, oh, I took the steroids, I took the other cyoprim, it didn't work. We actually have medications that we use as immune suppressant medications for liver transplant that we are very comfortable with, like cyclosporin or tacrolimus or mycophenolic acid. Um, and, and, uh, and we can really get any patient under control we don't have any difficulties. Recently, uh, the, we started using beducinide. Once I control the patient on corticosteroids and get them into a safe stage, I can replace the steroids with beducinide because it has less side effects than the corticosteroids. Okay, so the idea about autoimmune hepatitis, let's find the patient early. Let's make sure our diagnosis is correct because I'm gonna commit my patients for three, four years of immune suppressive therapy. 
What about if the immune system attacks the bile ducts, the very small bile ducts, that's what we call primary biliary cholangitis. And if we miss that disease, they develop cirrhosis, then we call it primary biliary cirrhosis. Again, more women than men, and we see it in younger people and older people, but we get, we get these patients where they, when they are around their 50s, and there's a whole mark blood test called AMA. If I have a positive AMA, 95% of the time they have PBC, and it depends how far they are in the disease uh, uh, history, I can predict their outcome. Incidence is increasing, and you can imagine why it is increasing like any autoimmune disease. You inherit from your parents, certain genes that put you into a position to be susceptible to develop an autoimmune disease. But there is an environmental trigger that makes that happen. And so far in PBC, there's a lot of research trying to show that that environmental trigger might be an infection that leads to a change of how the bile duct cells look, then our body say, oh, that's not my bile cells. I never seen it like this before. Then our immune system attack it. And if it keeps attacking it for a long period of time, I develop cirrhosis. Now, doctors can easily diagnose this disease once it comes to their attention. And once we this diagnose this disease as part of working up my patient. I want to make sure they don't have any other autoimmune diseases, like you know, Sjogren, Reynolds, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis. We talked about psoriasis. So any anyone that has any of these things, we screen them for PBC as well. Now, do I need to do a biopsy? No, we don't need to do a biopsy. A blood test positive and the liver numbers looks exactly like PBC, I don't need to do the biopsy. But in the old days, we used to do the biopsies and we can look at the bile ducts, which you can see here, the arrow showing you a bile duct that the immune system, all these dark blue cells are immune cells attacking the bile duct, trying to kill it. And if it kills it, that's how we lose our plumbing, our bile ducts from the liver. If this happens, the patients start feeling fatigued, they start getting pruritus, itching. So anyone who comes to me itching, I make sure they don't have this disease. If, if, uh, if a middle-aged woman comes in with significant fatigue, we make sure they don't have this disease because the, the prominent, most common symptoms in patients is itching and fatigue. Then we make sure their thyroid is good. They don't have any other autoimmune conditions. Very easy. If I control the disease, I improve the survival. And what do we mean by control the disease? This is data showing that if the alkaline phosphatase, which tends to be high in this disease, if I drop it below 200, my patient will live many, many, many years without the transplant. But if I can't, and the disease is moving fast, once I give them transplant, almost they are out of, of that condition. Although very, very rarely it can come back after transplant, but it would take 30, 40 years to injure the liver. So once we transplant these patients, they do well. But the whole idea for us not to wait for transplant is to prevent transplant. And now we have two medications available on the market that can help us in controlling that disease significantly. Also the oxycholic acid and the other medication of, of Caliva. So these are two medications. If the also doesn't work, we add the Caliva and these patients really get very well. And you can see here the survival improves even without any transplant. So now everything fails, I give them a new liver, you know, and they have a 90% survival. 
through the surgery and 85% of them live forever. They don't die from the liver anymore. They might die from other reasons, but not from the liver. Now, overlap, can we see two diseases like the first one I talked about, autoimmune hepatitis and PBC and both features, we call them overlap. They are not very common, but the most common liver disease in women is PBC and taking just a straight um, good history from the patient doing the, the one blood test that can be diagnostic really nails down the diagnosis. What about if your body attacks the big bile ducts? And that's what we call primary closing cholangitis. We tend to see that in men more than women, by the way. And we don't have a good treatment for it these days, although we are trying this new treatment and there are very promising new drugs in the pipeline to help patients with PSC. We have done a number of studies and to a certain extent, we were very satisfied with the outcomes of these studies. But as you know, it takes five to 10 years to get these drugs to the FDA for approval. Now, now very important piece. Anyone with ulcerative colitis needs to make sure they don't have PSC because PSC, any patient with PSC, 80% of the time, they have inflammatory bowel disease, mainly ulcerative colitis. So to a certain extent, uh, why patients develop it, which we talked previously about genetics and then some environmental factors. So complex genetic associations put an individual at risk for PSC, but they might never develop PSC. But there is a environmental factor that we are trying to figure out what's in the environment, what's inside the gut that causes ulcerative colitis and PSC. We are trying to figure out what really pushes the trigger for the person to develop that disease. Multiple factors, many of these bile ducts, they get attacked in different parts. So the area that gets attacked gets fibrotic. The area that's not attacked is normal. So we do an MRI and the MRCP and the MRCP would say there is beating. And if I take a biopsy, which we don't do anymore, you can see the bile duct here is in the center of my slide. And that bile duct has a lot of scar tissue around it. We call it like onion skin, okay, around the bile duct. And you can imagine it keeps compressing the bile ducts till it kills it. Okay, so very easy to diagnose it with MRCP. Biopsy is not important. And to a certain extent, the one disease that I want to make sure it's not it, it's in the differential is the IgG4 because if the patient has the strictures from IgG4, very short course of steroids can reverse the whole disease. Anyway, very important that we evaluate these patients and to a certain extent, these patients, we give them also dial. It doesn't affect the course of the disease, but when they start getting too much problems with their disease, that's when we say, let's give them a new liver. And you can imagine here, once we give them a new liver, they are cured from that disease and they do very well. Okay, so definite, def definitive treatment for decompensated patient with PSC, 85% five year survival. Can patient get it after transplant? Yes, it can happen after transplant, depending on how the doctor who's taking care of this patient manage the immune suppression. Okay, new therapies. I love that, new therapies. Why? Because we have over six, seven new ways to go after PSC. If one or two of them works in the next five years, we will change the entire disease uh, uh, that affects some of our patients. 
Okay. So big bile ducts, when the our immune system attacks the big bile ducts, we get P PSC. Now we said we have to make sure it's not IG4. I, I just recently this year, I had one of these patients that came to me with big tumors in the liver that everyone said that's liver cancer. And then when they came to me, to our group, we have a liver cancer group and we looked at the films, the MRIs, it didn't look exactly like cancer. So we said, let's do a biopsy to confirm if it's cancer or not. So we do a biopsy and it comes back, it's not cancer. And then it looks like PSC and we did the blood test specific for IgG4 and it came back positive. Guess what? We treated them with steroids. The lesions, the masses in the liver, there were like three different big masses. They melt away. Unbelievable. One of my fellows is writing that in a paper because we should not forget that entity that we call IgG4 associated cholangitis. What is sarcoidosis? Maybe you never heard about sarcoidosis because it's usually a lung disease and it looks like TB, but it's not TB, okay? And the interesting thing about sarcoidosis, it is your immune system affects my lungs or and my liver and I can have sarcoidosis everywhere. It can be in the liver, in the lungs, in the skin, in the salivary glands. And once we diagnose, it's so easy to treat it. And it, you know, when we treat it, we actually reverse the whole disease. We used to get these patients for liver transplant, and we used to get them because they look like they have a lot of cancer in their liver. And then with a, a simple biopsy, we see what we call granulomas, and the granulomas doesn't look like TB, but it looks alike. And then very easy, we diagnose sarcoidosis, we give them steroids and we can reverse them totally. And we never transplanted a patient for sarcoidosis because by that time we finished the workup of the patient, we nail down that diagnosis and we treat it. Okay. The last one that I'm going to talk about tonight, there's a lot of autoimmune diseases, but let me, yeah, I'm giving you the most common, celiac disease. So everyone talks about gluten, or oh, I can't eat gluten. If I eat gluten, I get diarrhea, I get pains, I get cramps, or oh, I probably have celiac disease. Now, imagine gluten in a patient sensitive to gluten, you, the patient forms antibodies that eats up the villi in the gut. So how the liver is involved. Once you remove the villi from the gut, the gut now a, allows a lot of toxins from the intestine to go into the blood to the liver. And we start seeing complications of celiac disease. And if I treat the celiac disease, just by stopping uh, the 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 gliadin and the and and the and the foods that leads to that condition, I improve the gut. I start improving the liver. Very interesting, you know. Initially, we never thought about it, but nowadays we see a lot of patients with celiac disease presenting with liver disease, and we can easily control that without any issues. I hope I gave you a glimpse of what autoimmune liver diseases are, and I hope it was not too uh, simplistic and not too complicated, but the good news is that now we have good way to diagnose these diseases, and we have existing treatments to control it, and we have in the pipeline approaches that might cure some of these diseases. Okay, and I'll be happy to entertain any question. Thank you so much. What a great overview and how very comprehensive it was. Very, very helpful. Thank you so much again.
All right, so I have a couple of questions and I also have some comments. Um, firstly, I wanna go all the way back to the beginning of your, of your presentation where I feel like it's really important that we maybe drive home one of those first kind of topics you were talking about. And that was that pretty much anything that's causing inflammation in your liver over a long period of time will cause a problem, right? So long, lo inflammation, long standing, leading to problems. Um, a lot of people, perhaps don't take a lot of the supplements that they use and don't take that seriously when maybe their doctors are telling them that while your liver enzymes are elevated, maybe you shouldn't take all these things. Do you have any experience with that? Yes, and we actually do some studies about that, you know, because it's uh, 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 a lot of people believe that if you have a chronic liver problem, you need to supplement your liver with vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and, and milk system and all this. The very famous uh, uh, um, uh, complementary types of medicines have been investigated. Milk system, the NIH spent over $20 million studying milk system, and they came to the conclusion that milk system doesn't do much for the liver, okay? And we used to say, oh, we will give it because the, the patient says they feel better. Even when they did the study correctly, they said it has no impact. Now, anyone who has a liver problem, anything they put through their mouth is gonna end into their liver because that's how our, how our gut works. So if I drink, eat, swallow bacteria, swallow toxins, swallow viruses, whatever I eat, it's gonna be absorbed in the intestine, goes into the portal circulation, go by the liver, say hi. The liver now say, oh, you are a toxin, let me get rid of it. Oh, you are a vitamin. Oh, I need you, let me store you. No, your heart needs you, let me send you to the heart. Oh, we have too much of this vitamin, let's get rid of it, okay? So, when I get a patient with chronic liver disease, the first thing I do, I say, stop everything. And you would be surprised how many patients the liver number starts to get better. Right. Because sometimes they are taking a, a plethora of supplements that you cannot figure out which one really affects the liver. So sometimes we say, okay, you like your vitamins. Let's stop everything. Give it four or five weeks, check your liver, Oh, your liver is normal. Let's introduce whatever you like one by one till we figure out where is the problem. Now, the liver is so smart that can tell the intestine what to absorb depending on what the liver needs. So if my body needs iron, the liver is gonna tell the intestine absorb iron. So balance your food, my advice, balance your food, eat everything. Now. You can come and say, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat proteins. I don't take too much iron. Okay, maybe I will need to supplement you with some iron. But if I eat a balanced meal, I eat my salads, I eat my fresh fruits, eat healthy, what we call healthy. Your body is so smart. Your gut is tremendously smart. Your liver is so smart to balance everything. Right. So that's my advice moderation and everything and take it easy <laughs> great we do have a question from our audience um, it has to do with the celiac you were talking about at the very end of your presentation they're asking i stopped gluten before my liver problems is there any way to test for celiac without having to eat gluten again for a month before that test sure there's very specific blood test for celiac and if you tell your doctor i want to test for celiac they will do the blood test Okay, nowadays, nowadays, we started seeing people who don't have celiac, but they cannot tolerate gliadin, and they cannot tolerate certain foods. And we, we call it, you know, non-celiac gliadin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. If you eat, you feel uncomfortable, don't eat it. Okay, that's the best way. Whether you have the disease or you don't have the disease. Because over the years, we changed our grains, our flour changed. Over the last 30, 40 years, we uh, genetically changed 
a lot of our foods. Our bodies over thousands of years got used to certain grains with certain proteins, and now we are changing it. So you can expect that some of us would react to some of these products. If you react to it, avoid it. Understood. Okay. A couple of other things going a little bit back to the beginning of your presentation, talked a lot about the types of immunosuppressive medications that you can use to help combat autoimmune hepatitis. Um, in my own experience, again, as a physician assistant working in liver disease, um, a lot of people have concerns about those medications and some of the side effects that they can cause. And I can imagine it can be very challenging to balance, right, wanting to care for the liver, but also make sure we're monitoring and making sure that the immunosuppressant isn't having a negative effect. So could you just comment maybe a little bit on how you are monitoring and making sure we have a good balance? Okay. So... When my immune system attacks my liver, do I need to put it into stop? No, I need to decrease it a little bit to the extent that my liver is not complaining, but I'm not abolishing, I'm not suppressing my immune system because my immune system protects me from viruses and infection and so on. And we learned this in transplant. If I over immune suppress someone after transplant, uh, you know, I always fight with my surgeons because they care about the organ and I care about the rest of the patient. <laughs> so they want to give more immune suppression and I'm trying to always sneak in. Let's cut that immune suppression a little bit. It's a fine line. So too much immune suppression, you get into problem. Too little immune suppression, you can reject your organ or you get into problem and the liver will flare up. And that's what we learn over the years with experience. And my suggestion and doctors call me and I say, let's try this, let's try that. Let's keep a close eye on the patient every two weeks, check them till we get to that combination that prevents the liver injury and minimize the immune suppression. It's better for me to keep someone walking around with a good immune system, right. but not too robust of an immune system that kills the organ. Perfect. And in commenting a little bit more about how you were talking about after maybe a couple of years of somebody being on a medication for autoimmune hepatitis and you feel you have the data and they're in remission and you can st potentially stop treatment and see how they do. If you're aware that this patient potentially already has like maybe advanced liver disease or you're suspecting cirrhosis, would you have that conversation or take that risk? Or would you rather just continue medication to not let them have a flare through? We will never take that risk because the flare, a flare in someone with cirrhosis can push them into decompensation. And we have pulled people with decompensation with the proper diagnosis with the proper treatment, we got them back compensated. That patient is gonna stay on the medication for, for a long time. And that's what we're talking about, the new studies, that the key thing about the studies, that, you know, think about these studies. Why a new, why a pharmaceutical company come with a new treatment? They need to come to solve a problem we have, which is, my patients committed to immune suppression for 10, 15 years. Can you give me something new where we don't do that? So the challenge for the new medicine, we have good medicine that can control the disease, but my patient has to take it forever. Right. So the new medication is coming and saying, can we withdraw this chronic medicine, introduce our new medicine for a shorter period of time and reverse all these injuries. They have to prove it. The FDA mm -hmm. will not stamp their approval before we show it's safe and we can do that. Great. I just wanted to make two other comments, just a little bit about my experience and hearing some of the new things that maybe I was not aware of anymore, being that I've moved out of liver disease. Um, incredible to hear about these new um, medications coming down the way for PSC, because it did seem for a while there, a diagnosis of PSC had very limited types of treatment, and we really did not have very many things for our patients. That's really, really great to hear. Yes, and, and, and that makes us 
more sensitive to finding these patients early before they get the irreversible damage. Right. So what we are doing is fatty liver. Find them early before they get into uh, what we do is hepatitis C or hepatitis B. Vaccinate them. We heard about the vaccine. This is the way to eliminate such diseases. If we vaccinate every person against hep B, we will never have hep B. So prevention, 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 as as our moms used to say, you know, prevent everything and, right. and don't get into trouble. All right. I'm going to ask if anybody else in the audience has any additional questions. Otherwise, um, I'll give it a couple of seconds just to see if anybody wants to type in. Nope, someone says they typed in and they're asking if I can see it. Give me just a second because I don't see a question. Give me just a moment. You know what? I am actually seeing now for some reason all a bunch of questions just came in all at once and we are almost <laughs> out of time. So I'm going to try. I'm not even kidding you. They went crunk. And a bunch of questions just all came in. So let me see if I can see. I see the gluten. Oh, someone had asked specifically about different foods and weight loss, but I'm not seeing specifically what that question was. Okay, but I do have I, one here. I can okay. make a quick comment. Weight sure. loss is good. Any weight <laughs> loss is good. Uh, the there is one thing that that uh, became obvious from the data, like when I talk to my patient with fatty liver, and I say you need to lose some weight, and they say how much weight? Oh, I am 270 pounds. I'm supposed to be 170. Uh, am I gonna wait till I be 170 to be healthy? I say no. Actually, if you lose 10 percent. Of the of your weight, your liver recovers tremendously to the extent that the fibrosis starts to go away. So what I'm talking about if someone is 270, lose 10 percent means 27 pounds. So they will go down to 250. They are still overweight, but that drop in weight makes a significant has a significant effect on the liver. So the goal is I'm not trying as uh, every my, uh, any of my patient or everyone in my patient to achieve the ideal weight, just mm -hmm. a little bit of weight loss. What about if I get 5% weight loss? Your liver enzymes will normalize. If I get 8%, your inflammation will go. If you want the fibrosis to go, give me 10%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so controlling weight now. There's a problem. When I tell some patient you have fatty liver, they think they the first thing, I don't eat fat. No, fatty liver is not eating fat. Fatty liver is eating sugars and carbohydrates. When I go at night to sleep and I didn't burn my carbohydrates and excess sugar in my blood, the body doesn't like it. So the liver picks it up, make it into glycogen. After they are done and stored everything in glycogen, they start making lipids and fat. So fatty liver is too much carbohydrates and sugars. It's not eating fat as much. So to a certain extent, uh, you know, cut down your sugars, cut down your sodas, cut down certain foods, and you can actually have a significant change in your liver. And part two to that question, which I think you did comment on, I just want to make sure we do. If that improvement, right, in weight management, its effect on autoimmune hepatitis, if there was some kind of an overlap going on, if somebody was a bit overweight, yes, perhaps we would then see an improvement if there was a fatty liver component to their liver as well as the autoimmune hepatitis. Definitely, because we always try to think in one disease. No, the liver gets a, a number of diseases. You mm -hmm. know, I'm a slightly overweight, I get autoimmune hepatitis, guess what, I drink alcohol, once or twice a week. Now I have three injuries to the liver. 
The fatty liver makes my liver more susceptible and weaker liver cells. The alcohol easily can kill these cells and the autoimmune hepatitis makes it worse. So peeling the onion, removing the first uh, uh, insult and then the second insult, everything helps. Got it. And then lastly, in our last couple of minutes, um, this may be an in-depth question, but if we could maybe touch a little bit more on that PBC autoimmune hepatitis overlap, what exactly are you looking for to make that overlap diagnosis and do you change treatment based on it? Uh, yes. So when I say overlap, which one is the predominant? The autoimmune, then I give steroids. The PBC, then I give the PBC treatment. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the overlap. And you know we we tend to say overlap at the beginning, and then as time passes by, the dominant disease will declare itself. All right, let me just see. If you're monitoring labs, which one are we tracking? Um, they're asking if it's just ALT. Uh, we 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 don't only monitor ALT because we monitor ALT, AST, and bilirubin, GGT because all of in PBC, PSC, ALFAS. So it, that's the what we call a liver panel. So mm -hmm. you know when we monitor, we look at the liver panel so we can know which parts of the liver is getting better. And also, we often use a lot of ratios, right, to see if multiple different numbers within that liver panel are elevated helps us come to a diagnosis as well. Definitely, definitely. Okay. I think we actually were able to go through all of the questions. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, you Dr. Very much for this nice evening and I hope uh, we, we contributed a little bit to the Liver Coalition. Absolutely. Thank you all very much and we hope you join us again for more of our webinars.